How do we approach the study of Muhadib's father? A man of surpassing warmth and surprising coldness was the Duke Leto Atreides, yet many facts open the way to this Duke. His abiding love for his B'nai Jesuit lady, the dreams he held for his son, the devotion with which men served him. You see him there, a man snared by destiny, a lonely figure with his light dimmed behind the glory of his son. Still, one must ask, what is the son but an extension of the father? From Muhadib, Family Commentaries by the Princess Irula. Welcome to Reading Dune, a podcast where we read Dune by Frank Herbert and talk about it. If you're a Fremen or a first time reader, this podcast is for you. My name is Caleb Pauls. And I'm Evan Diaz. And together, we're going to read some Dune. Yeah, we are. Yes, we are. Bam. I am so pumped for this chapter. This was a cool one. I liked it. So we've heard about the B'nai Gesserit plan. We have heard about the Harkonnen plan. We have, ho- we have learned what, who are some of Paul's companions. Now we're going to get the Duke's plan. Yeah. We've just heard about who this guy is. We're finally going to hear what he's got to say to Paul as they're walking into this trap, which they all know is a trap. They all know it's a trap. And that's why we have our uh, mood lighting today. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> if, you're wa- if you're watching on YouTube, w- yeah, it's been, we got mood lighting. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, yeah, we're also on YouTube. Um, if you want to go to uh, YouTube Reading Dune, there you are. You can see what Evan looks like. What I look like, <laughs> or not? Hey, I like. I really like, um, like some podcasts. I would just listen to for like seasons and seasons, and like have no idea what the guys look like. And then I saw a picture of them, and I was like, I'm done. I'm done reading this podcast because the mystery is gone, and now I know the face that goes al- <laughs> goes along with that voice, and that's just weird now. I have that's had that happen to me too. And if that's you, please. Don't go to YouTube. Don't look at us. Don't, Don't look, look at, at us. us. Hopefully, your imagination is much better than what we actually look like. And I'll take that. Yeah. All right. So what did you pull from the quote? Um, well, what, what I'm getting is kind of like, obviously, like they call him Wadib in the quotes. And there's obviously some greatness that he's going to achieve, which I don't know, because again, I have no context. I've never read this. I've never, I have nothing, nothing. Um, And in reading all of these chapters and this chapter talking about how and how much of a just good man he is seeing like them say that, um, a lone, he's a lonely figure with his light dimmed behind the glory of his son. Like, whoa. And I think, I think that's what all good parents want, right? They want their right. children to go above and beyond them. Um, so I think it's a really, and as we look at kind of the Duke's past and what he did for Paul, you really see he, he puts all of his eggs in the Paul basket, like his son and whom he loves. Right. He wants to give everything to and wants to prepare him that hopefully he will become more and ascend his station even more. Because the Atreides at this point are kind of a lowly house. They're like in the middle like rung of houses. Yeah. Lower middle class of the high class. Yeah. He's like (laughs) positioning himself to like aim for as high as they can get. Right. You know, because that's what we're here for in in the, you know, the galaxy, the Imperium. Yeah. Power and control. All right. So we're still in the training room. Right. Still, same day from Gurney and Thufer <clears> and <throat> same day as Yui. So this is the last little bit here. So Paul watched his father enter the training room. So the guards take up their stations outside. One of them close a the door. As always, Paul experienced a sense of presence in his father. Someone totally here. Mm. 
that is my goal in life, right? When I enter a room, you just know. Yes. This is somebody who's completely here 100% of the time. That, that like, what is that? That, that ambiance? I forget. Somebody was talking about um, some president. I don't remember if it was Obama or if it was one of the older ones, but they had a meeting with a president. Now it's just like folklore. I'm just telling a random urban legend story, but it was like they were the only person on their, this guy's whole schedule. You know, like when he walked into the room, he was there for that person and that person alone. And that's how at least he made people feel. And there's something really powerful about that. You know, like it'd be one thing, like you go into a room with a president or a CEO or somebody of like great importance. And they're just kind of like, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really a big deal and I don't really have time for you. So what do you want? But, you know, but when you can walk into a room with the power that people already know that you have and just be present, like, that's amazing. That's like extra power, you know? Yeah. That demands respect. Yeah. Can you, because okay. it gives respect. Yes. 100%. Go ahead and read the description of the Duke, if you don't mind. If I can find it, I we're totally will. On, we're still on the first page. Okay. <laughs> um, the Duke was tall, olive-skinned. His thin face held harsh angles warmed only by deep gray eyes. He wore a black working uniform with red armorial hawk crest at the breast. That's uh, such a, that's a weird uh, way to say that, but cool. Um, a silvered shield belt with the patina of much use girded his narrow waist. I had to look up what a patina was. I think it's like the, when something's almost rusted, but it's turned into like an emerald color. Yeah. It's like, it's like a, when you, with, with pipes, when you smoke a pipe and the stuff builds up on the inside, it's that kind of like build up. That's, that's called a patina in a pipe. So I'm assuming like if you wear like war gear stuff for long enough, it's going to get kind of like a coating of nasty on it. And that's just the way it is. Fun fact from Evan. That was nice. Hey, I had to look that up, but you already knew what it was. <laughs> the Duke says, hard at work, son. I want Paul to be like, hardly working. <laughs> it kind of does. <laughs> um, right yeah he actually says not very hard <laughs> <laughs> right such memory remember he's like 15 during all of this right um so right you know and then you have uh the duke's thoughts you can kind of you know see him here i must use every opportunity to rest during the crossing to arrakis he thought there will be no rest on arrakis and i can only imagine his life's already hectic at this point middle right. of moving planets like you're in the middle of moving and that's already hectic enough. Can you imagine like, I don't know, you probably can like moving everything and all the Dude. logistics. Moving like a whole estate and like, that's crazy. And I've moved uh, in my lifetime. I think I've moved more than the amount of years that I am old. Like we moved a lot growing up. Like that's not an exaggeration. That's like actual numbers and moving a small lower class Latino family around was already difficult enough. Like I can't imagine this whole like planetary estate type situation. Like that's crazy. Yeah. He mentioned wants to rest now. And once we learn how the, the guild liners work, like there's like getting into the ship and out of the ship. It's there's right. yeah. All right. But I want to go into who the du Duke is. I think it's going to kind of preface some stuff. So okay. Duke Lita the first was born on Caladan. Um, he was the only child of Duke Mentor. Um, and from the, he was the son of, from their concubine, Becca, who died in delivery. So he didn't have a mom. Uh, yeah. Leto took the reins of power at the age of 23 when an accident happened to his dad. And as a tribute to his determination and magnetic personality, he wore the ducal ring for 28 of the most turbulent years in the long History of House Atreides. I'm reading again from the Dune Encyclopedia here. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> so right after he died, he like 
he was always one of those leaders who were at the front lines. Right. right? So from, but for about 20 years, so probably, right, since he's 23, probably he's 43, he, he earned a rank and his name was known in the Imperium because of the type of, 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 of oh, because of the type of adventures he'd go on. So they would be called Black Flag or No Insignia. There's no declaration of war. There's no admission afterwards. They were like spy missions. Okay. That he would that he would raid the Harkonnen home planet of Giddy Prime. And he did this oh. at one point in time to free slaves. And that's where he met Gurney Halleck, was on one of these raids where they right. where they uh I think the numbers are they freed like approximately twenty thousand slaves and did immense damage. And then the slaves were taken back to Caledon where they were given their freedom and offered any passage they wanted to back home or they could stay. Gurney was one of those people that stayed. So you have this Duke who is massively devoted to his people, not afraid to be on the front lines, very much that warrior adventurer type. Yeah. But like righteousness, like he's, this is a righteous dude. He's freeing slaves. He's like, raising his son to be a great man. Like he's a righteous man. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we, we have one encounter that's recorded in the histories, quote unquote, right. Mm. Um, the, of the emperor meeting with the Duke. Okay. And it's said by the secretary that the emperor had a bunch of meetings lined up that she had to postpone and move because his meeting with the Duke went so long. Oh, they just like, got along and the emperor's quote as he came out to secretary he said if they were all simply as correct and as sure of their place as the duke the empire would be a paradise wow this is a person who knows his place and who he is in the universe yeah you know it's that when he walks into a room you know you know who's who's there yeah, this is this is like the way you're explaining it like this is the type of character that i really like in stories because it's your Aragorn character, right? He is the righteous and rightful king. It's the, it's the, uh, in, in a lot of ways, the Jon Snow character, right? He's like, I am going to stand up for what's right and the consequences be damned. Do you know, like we need to. You, yeah, you are rooting for him, for him from day one. Right. I know yeah. who you want to be. Um, but of course the emperor's acknowledgement of this probably led to his death because he was then viewed as a threat mm. because a lot of the houses in the lands are being like, I like this Duke Leto dude. I'm going to follow him. And the more people you kind of have there and kind of go downhill. Um, he got the nickname, the red Duke from the emperor, which is known as his reference for his Cheval his Chevalier title. He was steady, consistent effort um, that he just gave. And there was one point in time where Leto Atreides, their forces saved the day from the emperor himself. And this made the emperor very suspicious because when somebody's coming, is that getting that close to you? You, you, you think they're going to take you out. Right. At least in that world. Yes. <laughs> now, and that power hungry, when you're at the top, you're constantly paranoid about what's going to yeah. happen. Yeah. So that's the Duke. Great. Great dude. Um, we know that everything changed once he met Jessica, as all good men, when they meet wonderful women, life changes. Yep. Um, the arrival of Paul and Leto's obvious love for Jessica led the Duke to adopt a more domestic lifestyle. He went from adventuring to being more domestic. Mm -hmm. He said, I will have all that an honest man could want, the love of a woman, the loyalty of my subjects, the respect of my peers, and a son. So he, still went, he still went on campaigns with his troops, but he never um, fought bravely at the front anymore. He, was, he, was, he threw himself fully into the education of his son, so he put everything into training Paul. Right. Which he got Gurney to train him, Duncan to train him, his mom's working with him and the mentat who for how it is also working with him intensely. So bam puts everything into it, which I think knowing that he has a Bene Gesserit concubine, Jessica, 
Benet does it only create females to get a male is a kind of a big deal. You do kind of put all your eggs into this basket. Right. Cause who knows what's going to happen. Oh man. All right. So back in the training room. <clears throat> Boom. So we know the date again. He says, well, yes, tomorrow we'll leave. It'll be good to get settled in our new home and put all this upset behind us. I think there's a big emphasis on making sure that Paul, that Arrakis is Paul's home. Yeah. He's, he's not going to be successful if this isn't his home. Right. And kind of, it seems like trying to like get it in Paul's head of like, Caladan's over, dude. Like, we're not going to be here. We're not coming back. This isn't vacation. Like, we're going to Arrakis, and that's kind of just where we're going to be. And then and Paul recognizes that because the next question is like, is it as really as dangerous as everyone is saying? Like, you're my dad. Like, and you have like the Duke wanting to say, he says, um, the whole pattern of conversation welled up in his mind. The thing, the kind of thing you might use to dispel the vapors of his men before battle. Right. He would be confident and assuring, but he froze before he could vocalize it. And a single thought crossed his brain. You know, this is my son. Yeah. Gotta be, it's gotta be honest with him if he wants the best. Right. Right. Paul, Paul says he kind of like circumvents him again. You know, how it tells me there's a plan for the Fremen. Like dad, let me in on the plan. Like we had Fade Rafa listening in on the Baron's plan. This is Paul wanting to listen in on his, what's, what's dad going to say. Right. So, of course, the Duke notes that how it is. He's, you know, he's seeing all the possible, of, you know, outcomes, and he sees the best chance of making out alive, which is the Fremen. But of course, there is much more. There are other things we can pull from, right? They talk about Chom, and he said by giving him Arrakis, His Majesty is forced a Chom dictatorship on the Atreides. Like you are now, you now have big skin in the game. Yeah. Directorship. Yes. Chom directorship. Yes. Check yourself, son. Dictatorship and directorship seem <laughs> slightly they're different. Slightly, slightly they're different. Maybe they're not. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so we talk about Chom. Chom controls the spice, right? And this right. we have, um, his dad kind of goes over what, what, how many, where, where do the fingers of Chom get into? Right. How's this whole thing operating? So he says there's few products that escape the Chom touch, right? The Duke says mm-hmm. logs, donkeys, horses, cows, lumber, dung, sharks, whale fur. Everything. Whale fur? Come on, science fiction. They're in space. Oh. Who knows what's out there? Oh, yeah, dude. Whale fur. Right. Furry whales. Furry that's, whales. Yeah, that's totally a thing. It's exotic. Only found on certain planets. <laughs> <laughs> and he says that all of that fades before the spice melange. Right. Just a little bit could buy you a home somewhere nice far away from all of this chaos right like a handful yeah you said a handful by you a a whole home that's crazy and so of course paul's thinking all right if this is if we're going to be on this planet that makes the most valuable thing in the universe how do we control it how do we use it And so, again, the, the Duke kind of talks about Chom again with the levels mm-hmm. because they talk about everything is, is profit-oriented. So what were to happen if somebody, something happened on Arrakis and they stopped producing spice? Paul, you know, comes up, whoever stockpiles the most is going to have... Like the supply and demand is going to be so huge. Right. They're going to have a bunch of supply. The demand will be through the roof. They're just going to get even more and more power. And then you see the Duke nod and say the Harkonnens have been stockpiling for more than 20 years. Jeez. Like, all right. Cool. cool. And, And I think the Duke is like, follow the money. Like who has the most skin in the game? And those are going to be our enemies. Those are those people we need to like look out for. 
Right. All right. So Paul's like, okay, so if this is all happening and nobody wants their like profits to go down, they will turn a blind eye to whatever happens to the Duke. And he's like, would they attack with family atomics? And he goes, no, they won't defy the convention, but they will definitely turn his back. So Paul's right. like, so why are we walking into this? And I love that the Duke is like walking him through like step by step the plan instead of being like, this is what we're doing, dude. Just like fall in line. You know, like he actually wants Paul to understand everything that's happening. And he's like asking these rhetorical questions or like um, get coaxing the plan out of Paul as opposed to just like spelling it out for him and telling him where his place is, you know? It's like he wants to show them all the pieces of the puzzle and how they fit together and how they move. Because right. I think there's a bit, there's a, there's a metaphor that the Duke uses for how this all works, right? He says, knowing where the trap is, is the first step to evading it. So he says it's like single-handed combat. Yeah. Because again, um, oh, what, did the, what did the Duke challenge the Baron to? single-handed combat that's like their ultimate decider of who who does things so of course they train in these little knife fights these single-handed combat and so that's why what, what gurney was training with paul to know these moves and subtleties so that when you see an opening you can take it right and um i think you you see and then the next point what i think was really good that um, the Duke makes like, because Paul figures out, well, okay, the emperor is going to be behind this because he's got also got a lot of stake in the game. So do we just like overthrow the emperor? Do we, how would, do we try to get people on our side? And it's like, and, and then the Duke says, you know, making our enemy aware, we know which hand holds the knife. Ah, now Paul, we see the knife now. Who knows where it might be shifted? Like, if we can see where they're going to get us, let's not expose their plan. Where let's prepare for it. Yeah, let's not let them know that we know what they're what they're about to do. And I think, and this is the big plan, right? It's the we know the emperor have Sardaukar, and odds are, if the emperor has skin in the game, they're just going to be. I mean, the Harkonnens are already there that we're going to have Har Sardaukar disguised in Harkonnen livery. They're going to be disguised right. as Harkonnens. So now you're going into two of the worst forces. Right, which is what um, the Baron was talking about. That was like, he. this is Duke Lito being like, I know what the Baron's planning. Like, this is definitely what he's going to be doing because of X, Y, Z. And our response is, boop. Right, so now we go into... The Sardaukar and Seleucicunda, and we went over that briefly. That there, it's a prison planet. Yeah. That the emperor gains his troops from, and it's like one of the harshest places. And it's you; they become battle hardened because of how hard it is. Yeah. <clears throat> kind of like Bane. Yeah, like I. Dark Knight Rises. That right, was, was molded by the darkness. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> it's like a, an army of Banes. <laughs> so now from now on when we say anything that the Fremen are saying it's going to be in the Bane voice no no right? just the Sardaukar the Fremen are I, cool. <laughs> I have a tummy ache <laughs> yes yeah okay. the Sardaukar sorry yeah, the yeah, Sardaukar, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sardaukar. <laughs> they're, the bad, they're the bad guys we like the Fremen it rises because, <laughs> cause we, because again Paul's like focused on the Fremen how do we get someone like this and then to join us, what do we have to do? Like, we know this is the plan from the emperor and the baron. We know that there's this people group on Arrakis, and Arrakis may be as harsh of an environment as Seleucicunda. Right, so, at least some parts of it. And we don't know what's going on. And so Paul asks, how could you win the loyalty of such men? Mm. Right? How do you win the loyalty of somebody like on Seleucicunda or the Fremen? All right, 
So there are proven ways, and we're going to highlight this point. You want to play on the certain knowledge of their superiority, the mystique of a secret covenant, the spirit of shared suffering. It can be done. It, is, it has been done on many worlds many times. Right. So you got to have something they don't have, the knowledge, and know, you have to know that they have something that you need also, the knowledge of their superiority. This, you have to have something, a mystique of a secret covenant, something shrouded in mystery, which religion I think really plays into when you kind of have that right. Messiah type figure. And the spirit of shared suffering, I'm in this with you. We are oppressed. Gosh, that sounds a little culty, you know? Yeah. Well, come on. Yeah, yeah. They're, trying to, they're trying to think of the, the, the Imperium here. Right. Well, I mean, when you meet a battle-hardened people who are who don't need anything, it's the only way to kind of get in without being killed. Right. So, um, so then, yeah. So, if these people are on the planet, why haven't the Harkonnens used them? Well, he says that the Harkonnens sneered at the Fremen, hunted them for sport, never bothered to count them. And we know that nobody has done a census on them. They are just, right. they're people unto themselves, doesn't care. And so now, all right, so the next question is, if there are these people on this planet that can possibly help us survive this, how are we going to get them? So he says, are, we're negotiating with the Fremen right now, Paul said. Yeah. I sent a mission ahead by Duncan, Idaho, the Duke said, a proud and ruthless man. Duncan, but fond of the truth. We think the Fremen will admire him. If we're lucky, they may judge us by him. Duncan, the moral. Right? So this is what we have met. We've not met Duncan yet. Duncan is a figure that shows up in every book. Yeah. Hmm. Um, he doesn't have much of a part in this book, but he does. He's a character that is continued throughout the entire series. Gotcha. This moral compass of a person right. who is noble and true hmm. that hopefully this Fremen culture will accept. Um, he said, Duncan the Moral, Paul said, and Gurney the Valorous. You know, Paula thought, okay, Gurney is one of those the Reverend Mother meant, a supporter of the worlds. The valor of the brave, right? You got yeah. to be surrounded by these people who are good. Right. And then you get dad, the dad and son talk like, Hey, I heard Gurney like said you did well. And yeah, Paul's like, that's what, not really what he told me. You know, he told me I was being lazy. Canned laughter happens in the background. <laughs> 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 but I like how the Duke he's this is real life now. Like, I don't care. He says, I don't care how you kill, right? Which is kind of weird to talk about killing at this point with his son. But soon you, I assume you never have to kill. But if the need arises, you do it however you can. Tip or edge. Of right, because Gurney was being, was being poetic about, like, swordsmanship. And, right. like, it is, it is un, unbecoming to use the tip of a... And, that's a great, the Duke that's a great is just Gurney like, voice. oh, thank <laughs> yeah, The Duke is just kind of like, dude, I really hope you don't have to kill anybody, but if you do, just do it however. Like, I just want you alive. So, like, if you got to kill somebody to get out of something, just make it happen and just, like, be safe, you know? Be safe. I mean, that, good dad. That, that's, a, that's some big dad love right there. <laughs> um, all right. So, and then we talk about guild ships. So right. this is our first kind of mention of space travel and what this looks like in the guild. And we're talking about like guildsmen and what they are. So how this works is that the guild ships are, are huge. They hold yeah. everything. Um, so the guild, you'll go up and it'll, you will hold all the frigates, all the transports, and it's only going to, all of the Atreides stuff will only be a small fraction of what the, uh, Highliner, the guild is moving that day. So there's yeah. lots, there's going to be Harkonnens next to them, like, but nobody's going to jeopardize what the guild's got going on. Right. Because the guild is used, it's, this is secret, but they use the spice to 
shoot between stars and fold space time to jump from one place to another. Yo, did not know that. Right. And that's a secret that no one really knows in the book. But so that's oh, okay. why the spice is so important. Gotcha. Like, right. the, and Paul even says, like, I want to hope to see a guildsman. Like, are they even human anymore? They're definitely not. I mean, oh. they, may have, they may have come from humans, but they are like, they're more fish people because they live in, this is total spoilers and I love it, but it's dope. Okay, so okay. you have the guildsmen like, bathe themselves in the spice and live in a spice concoction so that they can see all the calculations of multiple things at different times because they had to replace the thinking machines that did all of this right. with the human ability. And they evolved in a certain way to live in this environment. So they're kind of like these little fish people with webbed hands and gills that see the future or possible or possible futures all of possible futures that's crazy and they yeah they're the other secret hand with the Bene Gesserit that controls everything because they control all movement right so and so because they control all movement that's like what the duke was talking about when he was like there could be Harkonnens like right next to us but the Harkonnens even with all their sketchiness aren't gonna mess with they're not going to leave their ship. They're not going to do anything weird because they don't want to jeopardize their relationship, like their family's relation, their house's relationship with the guild. Because if they jeopardize that in any way, they can't transport their goods. That means they lose all their money. That means they're gone. Yes. And he even warns Paul like, hey, dude, don't go looking for guilds, man. Just like chill out because we don't want to get screwed over by the guild either. Right. And so I really want to know what Duke Leto's like relaxing was on this trip. It could be just from the shuttle ride from the surface to the Highliner and then Highliner does its jump. Right? He must sit in his vehicle, must transport and then back down to the surface. It's going to, I wouldn't know how long that would take, but that can't be much of a relaxing trip when you're. Yeah, I guess. I mean, who knows? Like, who knows? I don't, maybe we should figure out how far. Arrakis is from Caladan and how fast the ships move and well, they, they do all the in, math. They jump instantaneously. Oh, shut up. Like, like, like teleport, like yeah. jumper. Uh-huh. From one spot to another, they can, they do all the calculations that it just happens. Or at shut least, up. That's how a couple of the movies have described it. And I think that's how he continued. I think that's how Frank describes it. You can totally... Listeners, watchers, call me on this and say, Caleb, that's, this is not how highlighters work. I will be open Why to Why do they critique. sound like that? Hey, uh, this is not how. Our... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but for real listeners, like, let us know. If, you got, if you've got answers to stuff that we're just like, I don't know, just like shoot us an email or a tweet or whatever mode of communication you want to use. Because uh, that's that- interesting. I want to know. We got our first email. We did get our first email. We totally sidetracked that. And we got our first tweet this week. So thank you very much. I'm very yeah. excited about it. Yeah. when well, we got our second tweet too, didn't we? Oh, yeah, man. We're rolling. We're rolling. You can find <laughs> us on Twitter at Reading Dune and email us at uh, readingdune at gmail.com. Yeah. Wait. Right. Um, what, was, what was the email? We talked about this email before. There was something cool about it. And now I forgot. Uh, guy's name is Robbie Hopkins. I think it's Robbie Hopkins. Could not be a guy. And I'm so totally sorry. Robbie Hopkins. We appreciate you. He says he's read Dune once before, but after a decade or so, it's time to pick it up again. New movie coming out in 2020. We're recording right. this in June, 2020. So yeah, that's where we're at in time for all you history nerds. Um, <laughs> It's crazy. 2020 has been crazy so far. Um, yeah. But no, yeah, super pumped. Yeah. All right. So there's one more thing I want to touch on before we exit. Okay. Okay. If you have more, please jump in. There's just one more thing. You know, I will. Um, uh, Jessica then pleads to, like, Jessica has told the Duke, yo, you have to have this conversation with your son. Right. Um, because of the way Mentats work, 
um, you have to let, you can train them up to a certain point, but at one point in time, they have to buy in. Right. And they have to consciously say, it's okay that you are doing this to me, which I think is fair. Consent is great. Right. Consent is awesome. But up consent. until the Duke said, um, son, you see, you may have meant at capabilities. Paul was just kind of, it was just happening to him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's like, wait, what? A mentat? Me? Er? And then he like, he like goes through the whole thought process of like, where is it? Uh, a mentat? Me? But I thought a mentat training had to start during infancy and the subject couldn't be told because it might inhibit the early. Uh, uh. <laughs> His brain explodes and he's like, oh man, they've been Mom, doing this the whole time. The weird things Mom's been doing with my hands and the focusing and the right. memorizing of weird numbers that Lufer made me do and the <laughs> learning to all these different languages and how fast I can study. Paul rubs his chin. <laughs> all the special training. You know, the mnemonics, the focus of awareness, the muscle control, the sharpening of the sensitivities, the study of languages, the nuances of voices, it all clicked into a new kind of understanding in his mind. Gosh, that's got to be heavy, dude. Imagine like being a 15-year-old kid and it's like, hey, uh, I know you're a, what, sophomore, but you've actually been, we've been training you to do this your whole life. That would, that would really mess with you. We or, also it would really mess with most. I think most Paul is definitely not ordinary right with this situation. And the Duke says, you'll be a Duke someday, son. A mentat Duke would be a formidable indeed. Right. Cause you had to buy mentats. They were heavy price. The, right. Hoover has been with the family for three generations and dramatically improved the Atreides, I guess, hierarchy, right. Of how far they've gotten up and right. what they've done throughout the generations. The Baron loves and needs his twisted mentat, and he's you know about to order another one. So right. like, you have to order these things to be one itself, and to be a duke that was a mentat would be a whole other ball game. Right, and then oh. he uh, he asks him. Right, there's like that moment where the duke asks him that I thought was really cool. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read it. Do um, it. He says, blah, blah, blah. A mentat Duke would be formidable indeed. Can you decide now or do you need more time? And he just says, like, immediately, it's like, or do you need more time? I'll go on with the training. Like, he's like, I'm, I'm in. Let's do it. You know, there was no hesitation in his answer is what it says right before the, the quote. Like, Paul is in. He's like sold out for this thing. Yeah. And I think he gets the weight of the situation. It was like he wanted to talk about the Reverend Mother, but couldn't quite get it out of him. Like he knows something's heavy about to happen. That's he's on the edge of this knife, right? Of this cliff about to jump off. And I think at that point in time, you can only say yes. Like you got to jump head first. Right. Formidable indeed, the Duke murmured. And Paul saw the proud smile on his father's face. The smile shocked Paul. It had a skull look of the Duke's narrow features. Paul closed his eyes, feeling the terrible purpose reawaken within him. Perhaps being a mentat is a terrible purpose, he thought. But even as he focused on this thought, his new awareness denied it. Like, nah, bro. You got more terribleness than just that. Right. Oh, man. Gosh. And this is the last chapter on Kaladin. Cool. So... In between this and the next chapter, they will have gotten into the transports, gotten in the Highliner, blipped, gone to Arrakis, and unloaded. Jeez, here we go. Hit, yeah, we are about to hit Dune. Dune, the planet oh, Arrakis. Oh, oh. Well, thanks always, listeners, watchers, for reading Dune with us. I am yeah. super happy to have you. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. I remember what Robbie's email gave us. Oh my gosh. The outro. Oh, give me, give it to me. What do we got? At the end of Robbie's email, he said, what was it? Stay spicy. But a bum. Hey, we were trying to find an outro to uh, this thing. 
Caleb said, catch, catch you spicy cats on the flip side or some really weird like that. And but stay, cats. St- st- stay spicy works. I think you should try it out. Stay spicy, my man. Bless the maker and his water. Bless his coming and the goings of him. May his passage cleanse the world. May he keep the world for his people. Bye. <laughs> you, have, you, just, you, have, you have to say bye, Evan. Uh, you just like super bye. complicated that. Hey, bye. Stay spicy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be me without that extra getting, getting extra complicated up yeah. in here. Oh, shoot. That was a good one. I'll see you next chapter. Okay, let's bump, bump, bump. I'm going to read this quote. Recording. Here we go. How do we approach the study of the Muhadibs? Oh, I already messed up. I'm going to start again. Golly. Can't read one sentence. How do we approach the study of Muhadib's father, a man of Suprat? (laughs) (laughs) Swear I can read. A man of Suprat. (laughs) Surpassing, surpassing. All right. Composure, scene. How do we approach the study of Muhadib's father, a man of sur- <laughs> damn man. surpassing warmth? All right, I can't look this, at you in this. This has got to make the, this has got to make the uh, blooper real. Uh, <clears throat> How do we approach the study of Muhadib's father, a man of surpassing warmth and surprising coldness, was the Duke Leto Atreides? Yet, many facts open the way to this. Duke, his abiding love for his been oh my gosh, I'm just tongue tied. <laughs> you can read it if you want. You want to go for it? Sure. Okay. 